Over to you, Andronike. Yes, hi. Uh, so welcome to our webinar. Uh, my name is Andronik Pavlida. I work at the Athena Research Center at Open Air, of course. Uh, here with my colleague today, Evgenia, uh, we'll present you the activities of Open Air Advance uh, on citizen science. So I'll give the room to Evgenia, please to introduce yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Evgenia Kipriotis. I work for Elino Germanikiagogi in Athens. Um, we belong in a big private school, but we're actually an R&D department dealing with projects. Sorry for that. Um, dealing with projects about education. So, Androniki, would you like... Irina, should we start? Yes, please. Okay. So, uh, what you will see today... Let's go. Let's start with an overview. So the outline of this presentation, of this webinar, is about Open Air Citizen Science activities. So what we are doing uh, throughout this project. Uh, all the activities are focused in schools. So you will see uh, a very, very brief introduction of the integration of, of those activities with current Open Air services. Not many details. And then you have a look of the first activity, which is the seismic schools network. So uh, when there is a seismic activity, there's a, there are data collected from schools. They, will, uh, they are in a repository and there are many applications that we can produce out of that. And then uh, we'll show you one of the events, the Hackwake, that were organized. Uh, the second activity is the Open Schools Journal for Open Science. This is uh, a brand new, fresh uh, and modern uh, journal uh, for students and that with the help of their, of their teachers uh, they submit articles. Evgenia will uh, present this very very uh, in detail, uh, very good. And uh, then you see again how Zenodo is connected with all that, uh, Zenodo by Open Air. And the third activity is about bringing Nobel Prize physics in classroom. So you will see again how something which sounds very different, difficult and very distant maybe for students, it can really get into classrooms. And then we have a good surprise for you, which is a very good practice example uh, of an article. Uh, so I'm not gonna say much more about this. And of course, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we're happy to answer. Um, so we start with the citizen science activities. Evgenia, please continue. Yeah, sure. Thank you, um, Androniki. So uh, before I continue, since we are not that many, can I ask if there's anyone from the educational sector? If you want, you can answer in the chat or I don't know. Uh, it would be good to know your background so that we can uh, explain how we approach citizen science in open air. So I don't see any response. So I guess you are not uh, from, you are not teachers or belonging to the this sector. Okay. So um, before um, starting, what uh, I would like to 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 clarify at this part is that in in open air we have uh, attempted something very unique. Um, we wanted to test how citizen science works in education. And uh, I have to admit that it has been a quite successful test. Uh, we have, uh, from the very beginning, decided to divide our efforts into three major sectors. So one was the school seismograph network, where we were dealing with seismic data. The second one was the Open, journals, uh, open Schools Journal for Open Science, which is a scientific journal from students to students, as Andraniki has already said. And the th third part was the access to research data, where we try to bring Nobel Prize um, physics to classroom. So we, we picked these sectors and we have developed educational content and educational activities that can be used in class in a way that citizens 
that students become the citizen scientists, they become the researchers themselves. They research and analyze and even publish their work once it is done. Um, Androniki, would you like to tell us how this um, yes. has been integrated in open air? Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, what you see here is a very simple graph which shows the process. So if you take, for example, the journal that Evgenia mentioned, and you will see later with uh, more details, uh, when, a, uh, when a student submits an article, this is reviewed. And also if it's accepted, it, it gets, uh, it is assigned with a DOI. So this, that happens through the editor of the journal, which is also uh, a member of the open air provide, so a content provider here in Greece. Uh, so the students don't have to do something very complex or their teachers, this is automated somehow. All the metadata, the information, the records, uh, everything that is needed, the licenses, everything is, uh, of course, packed uh, in that article. So then you have the index uh, on open air. So when you go to open air explore service, and you search for articles of the journal, you will find them available. So all this process respects the fair principles. You can find, you can access, and you can find also that information in Explore, uh, through Provide, and also in Zenodo communities. And of course, you can reuse uh, all these outcomes. It's a great example for students that don't have all this knowledge that we have as adults. And it's a first step they can make to this research path, let's say, the research trip. And Evgenia now is going to show you more and, you know, uh, enter all these activities in schools with more details. So please, Evgenia, it's yours. So thank you, Androniki. So as I said, we have divided our work into three main sectors and now we will, narrow, we will break them down to see what we have done in each case. So the very first is the activities in schools, the seismic data, the journey to this, of the seismic data. Actually, here we're talking about a school seismograph network. Um, truth is that this initiative has been initiated from Greece. Um, we, we are an institution running in Greece. And uh, in case you do not know it, Greece is the most prone country to earthquakes in Europe and the sixth um, worldwide. So there was a great interest there and we have cooperated with countries who are similar problems like Cyprus, Bulgaria, Italy, Turkey. And we have created this network where we actually put place seismographs in several schools. Um, here you can see a map of the 68 seismographs that are currently um, placed into schools. Uh, most of them, you can see that they are located in, in the countries that I've talked to you about, but also there is one in Azores, as you can see in the far left, and in far right in Israel. Um, we have picked this location because there is an extra uh, interest, especially in, in Azores, where we can also um, uh, have a, an insight of the, of the volcanic activity in combination with our seismograph in Sadorini, which also, also has uh, volcanic activity. So each triangle, red triangle that you see there, represents a seismograph, okay, in a school. Mm -hmm. If we move forward, we can see that once we click on, uh, on a station, we can see more information. We can see which one is this school and the coordinates of each school. Also, its seismograph has a special code that it can be recognized. Uh, how is that happening? So. The, the thing is that it can either start from the school so that there is one school that they have a special interest about uh, hosting a seismograph in their school. So they make, um, they ask for them to be funded to have a seismograph or there can be an interest from our side, for example, in places where there is a special um, interest, research interest. Um, because above everything, we, we gather this data and it is um, recorded 
for the National Observatory of Athens. So they have a, um, a whole picture of what is happening in the area. So once, if we know that there is an, a, an area that is not captured enough, maybe we want to, to uh, focus our efforts there. So what is happening is that we're finding a school, then we're finding a teacher who is interested into cooperating with us because let's be honest, there's some responsibilities when your school hosts such a, a delicate instrument. Then the, the, the seismograph is placed there and it is connected to a, to, to a computer that it has a Wi-Fi 24 seven. This instrument, um, it uh, records everything it gives data all the time and through the network of all the other seismographs we have, this data are distributed to everyone, not only to those that have a seismograph, but to anyone. It can be either used by schools or from any citizen that is interested to know what is happening right now in a certain area. Okay, so the main objective is the data collection. Here you can see a school list, uh, all the schools that have um, an instrument. You, uh, when I say instruments, I actually talk about seismographs. You can see the coordinates, so which is important, especially if you want to place them on a map or for an educational activity, this is some extra data. You can see exactly where they are, the city. You can see the technology used. We do not use always the same, uh, the same seismometers, the same seismographs, and of course, you have all the time um, a response whether it is online or not. Then you can have an even more specific status of each seismograph, which is very, very important if you want to have a very accurate research. Because for example, I have, we have picked a, um, a picture here, a screenshot where one of the, um, of the seismographs is delaying. It has a minor delay, as you can see, because you can see in the last column, the, the, um, the size, let's say, of the delay. But the, the last one, which is orange, it has an even greater delay. Okay, so these are all data that can give some extra to your research and it can help you be even more accurate. Um, apart from the data that I have, we have shown so far, at any time on demand, you can have access, any citizen can have access to this raw data. I have to admit that I don't know how easily they can be used by normal citizens as the, the type of the data uh, produced by seismographs are SAC SAC files. There are many who can use them, but uh, be prepared that you may not be very, it may not be very familiar for you to, to work that easy. But in any case, uh, this is uh, the visualization that you can have at any moment. If you click on a seismometer, this is something that you can see. Uh, one problem with uh, having seismographs in schools is that schools are very, very loud places. So sometimes you run the risk to um, get confused with what is a noise, what could have been a, a strong kick instead of an actual earthquake. But here you can see the noise, you can see this um, snow, let's say, around, but you can also recognize far on the left some, uh, some seismic activity. So this, you can have it anytime. Yeah. So uh, what happens now? So thank you, Vienna. Thank you very much. It was very clear. Uh, so you, you saw what happens when you have all these data you collect and what you can produce. So what we tried, something new in open air, was to, to collaborate with Helix and have the same data in Helix. So first of all, what is Helix? So Helix is an infrastructure, is a national infrastructure here in Greece that has three main action points. One is uh, to host, it's a repository, to host data publications and the third one which is very useful for our case is to log in create an account and have your own lab let's say private lab so what you can do in that lab is you can test out in an interactive and explanatory uh, way uh, with Jupyter notebooks uh, 
something that you want to see how it behaves uh, or if you trigger something else what happens so if what if you add some code uh, a script so in our case what we did we created an account and we used the data sets that Evgenia explained and we created again the graphs so what's the step-by-step -step process so the first step is you need the data from schools so, so far, nothing changes. You still use the, the same uh, hardware from schools. You use the same data from schools, from the same locations. The, the second step is that you need to store them in a repository. The same files, you have them, uh, you ask, it's on demand availability, so you ask uh, the providers to, to give you some of this data. And the third one, which is different in this case, compared to what you saw before, is that now you need to create an account, email for approval to the admin of Helix and explain, here is, this is my name, I want to use the Helix lab for this purpose. And then you need an upload, uh, to upload a Python script that is uh, created for the seismic activity data set. So we have a, a new Python script just for that. Then you run a Jupyter notebook on Helix lab you start your server and you open the Jupyter notebook. And what you get, you get really nice graphs and uh, out of the seismic activity. So the new actors here are not just schools, it's also Helix, it's Jupyter software, uh, also Zenodo because you can, of course, uh, use your output and upload what you found and open air. So let's see how it goes again step by step. I created my account, I had sent an email, so I got my approval. Uh, so I see here the menu, lab. If you don't get approved uh, by the administrator, you don't see my files and my courses. You only have two of these options, so you need to get approval. So once you are there, you can upload the file. So here I uh, there is a screenshot of the Python script dedicated for that purpose uh, that you can use. Of course, we can, of course we can share it. It's not uh, something secret. Uh, once you share it, uh, once you sorry, once you upload it, you see here uh, servers. So what happens? Now I have to click on servers. You will see this window which says available servers. And what you have to click, you have to click seismographic data. So I want to use the server that was set up, installed, created for that purpose. Okay. Then you run, you press the run button here to initiate the process. And of course, don't forget you have to uh, upload the data you want to use. Evgenia will show you where you can find them. And what happens next? So I clicked, I want to start my Jupyter server. Then you see automate uh, a window that says sign in with edinicdataservice.gr. So you don't have to do anything. You just click here. It will auto sign you in. And what you see here, you have an overview of the Python script that, we, that was created, that we use. You don't have to know coding at that stage. You don't have to rewrite anything here. So this is ready for you. It has many input steps. And at the end of this process, when you click run and you run the Python script, what you're gonna see is you see visualizations of the, of the data and you see, for example, the time and the distance. So what happens here is, if you check here, it says HL, SART. So this is the name of the station. And if you remember the list of the schools that Evgenia showed you, this is a gymnasium in Arta in Greece. And here you have another uh, school which has, which has this code, SIGU. So which one is this one? It's another gymnasium in Igumenica. So these two, they have a distance of 107 kilometers, the two cities. And as you can see here in the graph, when, there is a, when an earthquake happened, the first one in Igumenica, the first sensor uh, managed to, to get the signal and also monitor and also visualize it here. And then after a few seconds, the second one started to have the same uh, information. So you see a time gap. What we wanted to create uh, in our activities was also to show students how they can use these new tools, modern tools, and also let's have, uh, let's challenge them what they can create. So what they can create, so Evgenia, what happened?
Are you muted, Evgenia? We can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so based on all these things that Androniki just presented, we have created an event, Hackwick 2019, um, where we have asked from, uh, from teachers uh, to create an app, an early warning system. Uh, Androniki, would you like to watch the video or should we skip it? Oh, we could have a look, yes, of course. Oh, but wait. Uh, I think you, you have to swap share screen with video. It's, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, it's my mistake. Let's see. Let's see if there's voice, sound. Yes. We don't need apps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have the voice, the sound? No, no we don't. We don't. No way. <laughs> Um, mm. You know what, Androniki, I think that you, you, the, next to the faces and the ar blue arrow, there's, um, there's a, an icon and if you click on it, it's swap shared screen with video. And I think you have, you also have to select, uh, play sound from your computer, uh, not, okay. not from Zoom. So I don't know, maybe it's better if you, if we just post a link to this video on yeah. YouTube. Sure. Also yeah, okay. on YouTube, okay. on, on, on okay. the chat. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So what we wanted to show here, uh, Evgenia uh, found this great video. Uh, it's about the importance of the early, uh, early warning system. Let me copy paste in this zoom. So apologies, you cannot see it. Let's see. So, so yeah, the idea is historically how uh, all uh, cultures have tried to um, explain what is happening mm -hmm. uh, uh, during an earthquake and they, they tried, um, humanity has tried so, so uh, much to find ways to get protected from earthquakes. Uh, we have reached a point that we know that earthquakes cannot be um, uh, for there, there's no earthquake forecast, but what we can do is that we can gain a, a certain, a very little, uh, very little time before a big earthquake, so that we can save something, a few lives, uh, cities, something. So um, this um, uh, this uh, image is very uh, self-explanatory because as you can see the epicenter on the far left is where the the um, the earthquake is really taking place and then you see how the seismic activity is traveling in the form of waves you can see the first wave which is red one then you can see the second one which is yellow and as waves they travel to other parts of uh, of earth the problem actually is when these waves reach big cities, there is where the danger uh, is. And this is what we, this is the, the, the shape that we will take advantage of in order to create an early warning system. So what we have asked from teachers through this hackwake was that we have provided them with seismic data from five major uh, earthquakes which have taken place in Greece over the last couple of years and we have uploaded them on Helix uh, on editable forms and on forms that could be used also from uh, traditional computers that you can easily find in a computer lab in a school. So for the beginning teachers had access to all these data. And what we have asked from them is to cooperate with their students in order to develop an app using Python program language, which could warn earlier um, for an earthquake coming. Actually, the, if you break that down, what they had to do is that they had to um, check the activity on a seismometer, then check it with another one, exactly as Androniki showed you earlier, for example, with two very uh, close cities. And then they would know that if two of them have uh, given a signal, something was happening. And if they could 
um, certify that with the third one, that meant that an alarm should be set. Again, it will not be more than two seconds, but in some cases it can be enough. So think that at this case, we can see citizen science at its best because students with teachers, they're cooperating because they um, produce data from instruments that they host in their schools and that they are very active in their daily life, children can see it as they pass by from the classroom. Then they take this data and they analyze them. They use another uh, program language and they create an app and through this app they return to their community something that can be beneficial for everyone. Not, let alone that we talk about human lives here. So that was the, the, the initial idea. That, that the first part of Hackwick took place in October, as I said. It was actually a training for teachers so that they can go back to class and cooperate with their students and work as mentors for them. And the second one, it's meant to happen in 2020. Corona crisis um, happened and uh, it... Um, at the moment, it, it has been postponed, but in the second part, we, we will talk about products this time, about actual apps that can be used. Uh, in the next slide, you can see some pictures of how we have worked and how teachers have been uh, uh, trained by Helix people how to um, locate this data and how to make the, the, the better use of it of them, of all data. So yeah, this is, this, this is a, a very good example of how citizen science data can be used in education and, for, uh, and have a, a full cycle of it, let's say. In our minds though, um, there was something missing because for the time I have talked about how citizen science can be shown and analyzed by students. We have shown some hands-on activities that students could uh, get engaged and get involved in these citizen science activities, but we have decided that there was something missing. What was missing out of the research ro researcher role the students had was to publish their research. Okay, and this is where our journal uh, comes up. Open Schools Journal for Open Science. Here we talk about an international scientific journal from students. It is written by students under the guidance of their teachers and it is also targeting to students. So the audience is students. So if you happen to read any article, don't be very strict. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's from students to students, okay? So what we're, we're thinking is that they, the, the, the students, through the involvement in these initiatives, they follow the full cycle of the methodology of scientific research. And this is the last part uh, where they can publish their work as a researcher would do in their case. For the time, uh, journal, our journal has 270 users, 118 of them are authors, they have provided content, 91 is reviewers. Uh, this journal is peer reviewed, this is how we um, can guarantee for the quality of the uh, content. Uh, most reviewers are professors from universities that we cooperate. Uh, as I said, this is an international journal. You can find content in many languages um, and that makes things a little uh, complicated for reviewing, but we're working very hard to raise the number of the reviewers so that we can uh, offer peer review in all languages. At the moment, there are 154 published items. I talk about items because most of the, the publishing content is articles, full articles following, um, following the, the research cycle, but also there are some posters. Uh, many teachers find it much easier to work with their, with their students in the form of, of posters. So in these cases, they just provide a description and an abstract, and then you can see the poster. Uh, 
Uh, but already five more issues are planned to be published until the end of July, this July, uh, with more than 100 new articles this time. So you, there, there, there is, uh, uh, it, it has become quite popular. So if you if you visit one of the of the issues that is already uploaded, this is a table of contents that you can see. Um, uh, the the in in the text in red is actually the title, which is a hyperlink, and uh, you can uh, get into the um, the details of the article. And uh, the the line below is then are the names of the authors. If you click on the PDF uh, icon that you can see on the right, this is what you get. Um, uh, at the top, you can see the how to cite uh, click uh, button. Once you click it, you can take it, the citation ready for your research. You can put it there. It, the job is done for you. Um, and if you click on the PDF, this is what you get. This is the, the, the in blue, you can see the, the title and then the names and the affiliation, they're, they're actually the school they're going to. And of course, you can also download anything that you like on your computer. Um, this, if you click on the archives, you can see all the issues that have been published so far. And if you click on them, you can see uh, the, the, the table of contents and decide uh, what uh, reading would be useful for you. Um, we totally support students and teachers through every phase. We have created a very specific and detailed and thorough template that if they follow, we can guarantee um, that the article will include all the important parts. And also we can guarantee that all uh, items published in our journal are the same. Um, and this, um, template is, uh, um, sorry, Androniki, can we go back a little? Yes. Is also available in all, all the languages that you can see on the, uh, on the, on, in the list on the left. If there is anyone who would be interested to, um, to translate the template in their languages, please contact me. It would be great uh, because through that, it's uh, much easier for us to come closer to uh, more teachers and more students. So I would, uh, I would love to, to hear from you about that. Uh, the other thing is that we offer also support to reviewers. Uh, um, we reviewing on the journal is happening in full secrecy, um, as supposed to. But what we can what we can um, provide to them, um, giving credit to their uh, contribution for our journal, is that we we have the certificate of, of reviewing that all reviewers are getting once they have uh, they have uh, participated in that uh, part. Um, so, uh, Androniki talked about the integration of the open air services in our initiatives. And uh, here you can see how the journal is also hosted on Zenodo. Um, there's a not, on Zenodo, there is a special community about the journal, the Open Schools Journal for Open Science Community, where all the content that is found on the journal can be easily searchable also on Zenodo. Uh, again, uh, we follow and we fill in all the metadata to make it easy for you to get it. Once you click on one, I'm sorry it happened to be a Greek one, and uh, maybe that's why you do not recognize the alphabet. But here you can see in the um, in the beginning that you can see the title of the article, and later on the lower part of the screen you can see the preview of the PDF. Um, if we go to see the, the background of this work, uh, someone who wants to upload an article on this community, uh, the administrator actually, it's not that anyone can, um, has to uh, fill in some metadata which will help uh, readers to find exactly what they need. So amongst these is the publication date, a title, the authors, the name, surname, and the affiliation they're working for. In our cases, it, it will be a school. The access rights, in open air, we are very strict with the access rights and the licensing. You can name if you have received um, uh, funding from an EU project. And um, also, 
there are some optional metadata like the contributors apart from the authors some references journals that it, that the, the article has already been uh, presented conferences that could have, this work could have already been presented if it has been included in a book report or a chapter if it is a part of a thesis or the subjects that uh, this article is covering all these metadata are just to make the readers lives easier and the third part, um, I'm afraid there's less to talk about this one because uh, most of the work is done in classes. It's the Nobel Prize Physics on Zenodo. So in that, the, the, it was a very, very ambitious goal and we are very happy that we made it. Is What we're doing is that we bring together teachers and large science research infrastructures like CERN, for example, or Virgo in Italy, and we bring them together and they cooperate, the students, the teachers, and the researchers. So they exchange data. There are even cases that students give back, they analyze data and they give back to the researchers and they make you and the researchers make use of this data. Um, so here on this another community, we upload all the educational activities that we have uh, developed in order to bring that level of physics in classroom. Uh, what is surprising about that and why I said that it was a very ambitious goal and we're happy that we succeeded is that in Zenodo you can see how many times it has been viewed a, um, a resource and how many times it has been downloaded. Look, here we can see that it has been viewed 50 times and it has been downloaded by 42 people. That means that 42 teachers at least because uh, between the educational community now we have lost track of how it has been distributed, have found this content interesting in order to use it in the learning process. Imagine what a change that would make for, for students. Um, and uh, yeah, the surprise under Nikki talked yes. about, uh, as I said, when we started uh, planning these uh, citizen science initiatives of open air, we have found a gap. Um, we have found a gap of how uh, this work could be published. And that's, that's why actually the journal was developed. But we are very, very happy when we found out that some of the, of the students who um, published their work in one of our issues, they have actually made a new discovery. Uh, their abstract is in Greek, but it has been translated for you. And you can see that they have used um, content from Kepler's space telescope, and they managed to identify an exoplanet uh, in orbit around the star KIC 1432789, whose characteristics have been analyzed for the first time in this uh, article. So imagine what a difference it makes for children, for students to have access to this data, to be able to analyze them, and even more, to be able to publish them under the guidance of their teachers, to publish them in such a young age, to publish a new discovery. So I think that was from us. Yes, thank you very much. Evgenia, you are thank fantastic. Thank you very much. No, you are fantastic. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, Irina? Thanks a lot. I don't see any <laughs> questions yet. And any every, questions? <laughs> a, a reminder that you can use Q&A uh -huh. or if you want, you, you can use chat. Uh, and also, if you want, you can raise your hand and speak. Like in a classroom, don't worry. <sighs> yeah. And thank you, Esteban, for sharing your project link. Uh, so I don't know if if you'd like to say something or maybe if, if you have some suggestions for collaborations because there might be some synergies in citizen science work. So 
Gould again is saying that he would like to. Sure. To, to, no, no he, he's saying that he would like to make much more collaboration now. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, please feel free to use our contacts in the in the last slide of our presentation. Yeah. You can see our emails. We'll be more than happier to work with you. Um, uh, uh, for, for the time, I, we're not very familiar of, of your background, but citizen science is so broad, and I'm sure that we can find very, very um, um, useful manners to cooperate. Um, and uh, I think that many of you are working in citizen science project. Is that true? Um, because um, in the case of open air, we have done something very, very radical. Um, as we said in the beginning, we have tested the, 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 um, the citizen science and education. And uh, I can assure you that the results, or the outcomes of this test have been uh, significantly successful. So we are, we are very, very happy to continue working to, towards this approach. And um, we, we can certainly find um, ways to cooperate. I see, is there? Uh, um, hello, Pauli. Um, is I, um, uh, we, I'm sorry, what is the, I don't understand the question exactly. Yeah, may, maybe Pauli, you, you're asking a, a difficult question because it's a public <laughs> webinar for everyone involved in citizen science projects. It's not yeah. an open air only webinar. Open air AMCA is uh, a legal entity that uh, ah, open okay. air set up uh, and uh, Pauli chairs management and administration ah, okay, okay, standing okay. committee in this open air legal entity because we, we're not a project anymore. Yeah, legal entity. So he was wondering whether there are any plans to continue that in Amke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, Pauli, I'm talking <laughs> mostly about the content. So apologies. But yeah, keep in mind that this this approach of uh, citizen science and education can be very, very interesting. So maybe it's a part of uh, open science uh, innovation strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, that are being discussed within Open Science Policies Committee. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Gonzalo. So I only see Pauli's hand raised, but I guess, so if you want, I can allow you to talk, but, but I guess we're, we're already. Yeah. There's What's one that? more. Uh, if There's can... Esteban is asking yeah. about the slides, Serena. Yes, sir. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll wait, wait for a copy of slides from you and then I'll send uh, everyone who attended the slides. Yeah, and then sure. please yeah. go ahead, Pauli. Okay, now, yeah, uh, thank you. Very uh, impressive work you have done. And, and I, I was uh, just wondering is there going to be. What, what is coming next? Uh, because uh, the in European level, as as in open, also in open air, as and uh, as uh, Irina mentioned, the open uh, open science uh, part of uh, citizen science is a very important part of open science, and that's why I think we need more this kind of very interesting cases which you have done. And uh, in Finland, we don't have earthquakes or we have, they are so small that you don't count them. Uh, so we are not uh, cooperating in this way, but uh, the concept is uh, something I, I think for, for making uh, observations, uh, whatever the uh, target is. And then uh, the, <clears throat> Uh, searching the data and analyzing the data and especially the publishing part is, is important as you mentioned. So um, maybe we can think about some other uh, data sets which could be used in, in for example, in Nordic, Nordic countries where there is not the earthquake wakes are not the issue. But thank you very much for your 
Uh, thank you, Pauli, very much, because you, you gave me the, the chance to, to clarify that. Firstly, thus, uh, I understand that there are many countries that they do not have a special interest about earthquakes, but keep in mind that you do not need to have a seismograph in order to take advantage of this data. If, for example, in, your, in the, the topics and the thematic approach of uh, the Finnish curriculum, there is, let's say, a, a discussion about uh, earth science, you can have access to this data and you can follow the activities that we are suggesting. And in that sense, you can take advantage of this data. So this, this was the first uh, thing that I want to clarify that you do not have, you do not need to have a seismograph in order to uh, to um, implement these uh, activities. This is the first thing. And as for the journal, the journal um, is STEM oriented, and it's not just for the earthquakes and not just for the seismic data. We publish any article, any item that is um, uh, supposed to be uh, published, and it, ca it can cover any STEM uh, topic that you decide. And there have been cases that we receive independent articles on the journal and they follow the procedure and then eventually they're published. But also you can see that there are cases that we have made some special issues, for example, from a school. There, ha there have been schools that they have expressed an interest, some of their teachers, to publish a special issue. So it is just a special issue of this school. So think of it more openly. We do not want to be very, very strict, taking that this is students' work. So if you if uh, you believe that there's a chance that we can there's an opportunity in a school that they might be interested to publish their work please please feel free and i'm sure we'll find a we'll find a way to publish their work thanks a lot um, i don't see any questions so i guess that's the last chance for you to have the questions or comments um, Thanks, Amina and uh, Evgeny and Andranikia. That was wonderful, uh, very impressive work. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. Uh, I'll, I'll follow up. I'll, I'll follow up with slides and recording. Um, and, uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much, also, for joining.